Hello. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Shailendra Raj to MICA. The entire MICA community is thrilled to have your leadership, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Delighted to be here. My first question to you is, why MICA? Because you have traveled all over the world. You have been working with Oxford, Harvard, Duke, some of the most well-known universities in the world. Then you came to IIMA, then you connected with Ahmedabad. And now, why MICA? See, MICA is a unique institution. In fact, it would be difficult to find uh, an institution like MICA anywhere, certainly in this part of the world. And the reason is that uh, MICA combines uh, creativity and management in a way that no other institution does. So I think MICA is able to address some of the big challenges of our time, which is how do we deal with the digital revolution? How do we deal with how management is being applied across uh, different segments, right? The government, the corporate sector, NGOs, uh, educational institutions. And I think MICA with its unique history has a unique point of view uh, about how to deal with all of these institutions. In addition, I think uh, the way the world is going, uh, all the low end jobs will be automated. And that is both frightening as well as an opportunity. And I think this is where MICA uh, comes in, in the sense that uh, uh, the jobs that will remain, the jobs that will have the highest value addition, will be those that combine design, management, digital in some way. And MICA is best positioned to address the specific challenges of those uh, um, dilemmas, if you will, those opportunities, if you will, those possibilities, if you will. So thrilled to be at MICA. So you have worked with an incredible range of institutions. So clearly you are aware of challenges that higher education sector yes. faces around the world. And one thing you have emphasized is partnerships. Right. So how do you see the role of partnerships and the nature of partnerships for MICA uh, based on MICA's positioning and emphasis on creativity and ideas? See, the world can be thought of in terms of great civilizations, right? There are huge civilizational blocks. Um, we happen to be part of one of them, the Indian civilizational block, right? Which extends over Southeast Asia, parts of Southeast Asia. And so, therefore, uh, we bring a unique point of view. But there are others. There's the European bloc, there's the North American bloc, the South American bloc, the African bloc. And they bring some common problems and some common solutions, but then some very specific points of view. So, to be able to better understand what is happening in the world, we need to engage with every one of those civilizational blocks. And so, therefore, Partnerships are not just a good way to go, they are the only way to go if you're trying to understand problems which are global in scale. So focusing on higher education, what are some of the challenges you feel that Indian institutions are facing? For example, do we have faculty that has all the global experiences and expertise uh, specific to whatever subjects we focus on? How do we encourage a kind of global learning for our students. So I think the question is, what are the challenges that Indian higher education institutions face and how do we move them forward? Which is internal and external uh, collaborations in a way. So I think that raises uh, some very interesting questions. One, the culture of research is not as widely prevalent in Indian institutions as it ought to be. So the first task would be how do we strengthen and uh, deepen uh, that culture of research that, uh, that exists at MICA. That is number one. Uh, number two, how do we prepare individuals to deal with global challenges and global perspectives and global opportunities? So I think the point about building global partnerships is extremely important here because that allows us to develop a cadre of individuals who will bring with them the experience, the exposure, the tools, the techniques, and more important, uh, importantly, the sympathies that are required to be truly global. You are passionate about research. 
even in your early days, it's yes. very clear to the entire MICA community the passion that you feel about authentic, evidence-based global research. Right. You are going to be the president and director leading MICA, which involves a lot of administrative aspects. Yes. So two questions. One is, what are your research passions for yourself? Because in that sense, you are going to add that value to MICA. But also, how will you balance the administrative and management responsibilities with research passion? Because it's not very common for many leaders to have both qualities. You see, uh, I view research as integral to my functioning as a human being, in the sense that if I, if I do not continue to grow and learn, I will stagnate. And that will then permeate all aspects of my functioning, whether it is research or teaching, especially teaching. Because there are only two ways to teach. Either you're talking about the challenges of tomorrow, or you're talking about challenges of the past. If you're not doing research, the only thing that you can do is about challenges of the past, not challenges of tomorrow. So I believe that unless I engage with the challenges of tomorrow, I can't meaningfully contribute. So that is number one. Number two, in terms of my personal research agenda, I think the one thing that I'm very passionate about is figuring out what, how one creates high performance in organizations. In a, in a corporate environment, in an educational environment, in a social change environment, and in the government. So, one of the things that is extremely important in terms of my research agenda is identifying the commonalities of management across these four domains, but also identifying the unique challenges uh, that make these domains different from one another. And therefore, a simple-minded application of frameworks from one domain, say for example the corporate sector, into education is not only not helpful, it can actually be disastrous. So being aware and mindful of what it is that you can borrow across boundaries, but also uh, cases where you must respect boundaries, I think that distinction is going to be extremely important in my work. And uh, so, uh, so that is one part. And then the other part is looking at how some great institutions in the world have evolved in India, in Europe, in North America. What are the commonalities? What are the challenges? Are they similar? Are they dissimilar? How are they responsive to their context? How were they responsive to their context? That is something that is of great interest. And finally, uh, I believe the history of higher education as a unified whole has not been told partly because it's in three parts. The first 1800 years in India, remember we had the finest educational institutions from 6th century BC to 12th century AD. For 1800 years, the whole world came to India. Then for 700 years, roughly uh, 11th century to, uh, or 12th century to the 19th century, Europe was dominant. And then the 20th century increasingly belonged to America in terms of dominance in higher education. Those three have never been connected, never. Partly because the groups of scholars who worked on one didn't have expertise in the other. So how we bring a common perspective across that, which is deeply respectful of our own history and deeply mindful of the innovations in Europe and North America, but then taking the broader perspective of how, uh, this is ironic, uh, almost the same innovations came in almost the same order, separated by, thousands of, by over a thousand years. So uh, the, the irony is, if you look at how the early universities in India, like Takshila, evolved into Nalanda and Vikramshil, that process of evolution was followed in Europe in pretty much the same order, except 1,000 years later. So looking at those commonalities, so that we get to the deep sources of, uh, 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 of tradition and modernity in higher education, I think that is the key to my research. As you know, MICA focuses on management with strategic marketing and communication emphasis. However, we completely believe our building on Krishnamurti's message to us, who was the founder yes. of MICA, that MICA has to be recognized by the community. Right. And we have to communicate not just to the private sector or industry, but also to the community and social sector. And not many management institutions explicitly are focused on social impact. And I know you are very passionate about equality and social right. justice and recognizing diversity. How would you seek that balance for my kids who will come here to learn? You see, uh, one of the most interesting things that 
I discovered for myself uh, over the last 10 years was how important the way in which the NGO sector or the social sector operates, how important that is to the functioning of the corporate sector. And the reason is kind, kind of interesting. Uh, especially in matrix organizations which are global in scope, you have a relationship with many people that you have to work with, that you have to get work out of, who are neither your bosses nor your subordinates. They are, they are your peers, they are your stakeholders, and neither can you order them nor can they order you. So how you work with them, how do you add value to them, how do you get value from them, this is an art. And nobody has perfected this better than the NGO sector. And the reason is, people come and work in the NGO sector at a fraction of the salary that they would get in the corporate sector. So they are there because they are passionate about this. They are there because they want to make an impact. They are not there because they are part of some hierarchy. So therefore, if you try and operate in the NGO sector by ordering people around, by being hierarchical, by being focused on uh, power, you're not going to get very far. But increasingly, global organizations also have this characteristic of social organizations that to function, you have to willingly get people to cooperate with you. And so therefore, this is the mantra. How to have influence without authority is the function, is, is, is a skill that you need to learn. And nobody teaches you that better than the social sector. So I believe we need to take this aspect of social sector functioning into the corporate sector because if more and more corporate sector individuals internalize this way of functioning, they will be far better leaders and will be far more effective even in the corporate sector. That is the paradox. Fantastic. Uh, in a few days, we will welcome the new group of students who will arrive at MICA. So can you directly give a message for the incoming group of students? Uh, we all are excited to work with you and I think students would love to hear from you a message of welcome. Yes. So, you're coming to MICA at an exciting time. This is a time when MICA has so much to say to the world, where MICA's experience, where MICA's um, the tools and techniques that we have developed here and the faculty who are here, um, the, the way in which they have approached problems and the way in which they have dealt with those problems, they have so much to say to the world today. And to the Mycans who are coming in, the, the newest Mycans who are coming in, I have this to say. We will prepare you to function not just in the corporate sector, but if you so, so choose to function in the government sector, to function in the educational sector, to function in the social sector. And you will be trained to appreciate the similarities and the differences amongst these organizations so that depending on your passion, depending on your interests, wherever you wish to contribute, that you will be enabled to do so. And your heritage at MICA and your training at MICA will help you to do so. And you, in doing so, will be able to tackle some of the most interesting challenges in the world that operated the intersection of design, digital, entrepreneurship, innovation, uh, the corporate sector, the social sector, the government sector, the educational sector, you'll be able to take an integrated view and bring uniquely creative ways of dealing with those problems. Your time is now, Micah's time is now. Welcome. Thank you.